Wow, what a great room. I love this room. So thank you for coming out and getting here on time, first thing Monday morning in uh, Aarhus, which is at the center of everything. Um, last time I was here, uh, they used to have a J in the name of the conference. What did that stand for again? Anyhow. Um, so I'm glad you're all here. So I guess this is the part of the talk when I explain who I work for and why my company is great and why you should buy the products, except for I don't actually. I left my job at Google back in March and since then I've been having a huge amount of fun working on crypto and secrecy and privacy stuff and I'm going to talk about that next in one of the rooms around here. So, but I'm not going to talk about that now. Now I'm going to talk about browsers and how the internet is and um, which, which direction we're going. But, you know, before I do that, there's something that comes to my mind every time I come to an event like this and, and look around at the people, and I think it should come to your mind too if you look around at the people around you, and what I'm seeing is a whole lot of men and almost no women. And, and I just don't think it's okay for us to come to a meeting like this and not look in the mirror and think, are we really satisfied with what we see? Can we do better than that? You know, it's not just a theoretical problem. Because of the fact that we seem to exclude half the population from this profession, we're not only limiting the quantity of good work we can do, we're severely limiting the diversity and variability and creativity in the work that we can do because we're sort of a monoculture, and that's not good. So I don't really have a lot to say about that because that's not what they brought me here to talk about anyhow, but I think it's a problem that we need to be thinking about. And for each of us, we should ask ourselves, you know, are we okay with the way things are or do we want to start becoming part of the solution? And so have that thought and see if there's anything you can do to set things up so next year when we look at this room, the gender balance is a little less awful. So thank you for that. Now, let's get on to the topic of the session. So, is the browser dead? Is, you know, that's kind of a, a gloomy talk, and I guess I really shouldn't be opening, you know, the Monday morning keynote with a gloomy talk, but I want to claim that I'm well within the tradition of, you know, of, of, of this subject, because the browser's always been dead. Um, way back in 1997, Wired magazine said the browser was going to die, and, and to continue that theme, they said the same thing again in, in, in 2010. It seems like there's always been something that's going to come along and, and kill the browser, and it hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's still okay to worry about that. Um, and I will worry about that, but I don't want this whole session to be a big downer talking about the dangers of the future, so I want to start with a, a little bit of cheeriness um, and, and good news, too. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes uh, at the top of this talk talking about some good stuff that's going on, and in particular, um, I want to talk about uh, client and server programming. So let's sort ourselves into baskets. I'm going to give three categories and ask you by a show of hands to sort yourselves into them. So the three categories I'm going to ask you about are people who do mostly client-side stuff, browser and mobile platform, who do both client and server, and people who do mostly server-side stuff. So, so mostly client-side stuff? That's actually not so many. Interesting. People who do both kind of things? So uh, maybe a majority. People who are mostly on the server side? Uh, quite a few. So everybody in the room, those people who just put up their hands now, people who work on the server side, we should all be looking at them and feeling a lot of envy because right now we are living in the golden age of server side programming. Things have never been better. The tools have never been better. The way of thinking about things have never been better. And you know, it always hasn't, hasn't always been that way. Before I talk about how great the server side is, I think we should look back on the 10 or 15 years of Java nuclear winter uh, that, you know, that happened between sometime in the early 90s and 2008 or so. And, and back then, when we were building server side software, it was like, well, you know, the answer is Java and Oracle. What was the question? And thank goodness, those days are over. And we have lots more options, and even Java is getting kind of better, but, but I don't know about that Java.net, web, Java.com website. Um, I guess the lesson is that they love you if you do Java, or they love you if you have ancient laptops that look like they came from the days when Java was interesting. I don't know. Um, but, you know, to, to give fair to, 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 to Java, you know, it has gotten better and, and more interesting and, and, and somewhat less painful. Um, but the point is, you no longer are stuck. You can 
make choices. There are a lot of other choices you can use to build your system, and that's okay. I mean, one of the most popular choices these days still remains PHP. Now, we all like to sneer at PHP. Well, I don't know about you, but I like to sneer at PHP. Uh, but we, we probably shouldn't sneer at PHP that much because, after all, uh, Wikipedia and WordPress and Facebook and things were built primarily in PHP. So even though it's actually not a good technology, it's a demonstration that you can build good things with, with, with not so great technology. But you know what? We actually, if we're building server-side software, we do have a selection of actually really pretty good technologies to choose from. Starting with things like Rails, which I don't know if you've noticed, you know, Rails isn't actually leading edge or exciting anymore. It's kind of boring and enterprisey, and and that's that's okay. That's that's good. Um, although, as they say, web development doesn't hurt. But I don't know that website kind of hurts my eyeballs. Uh, they need to get a designer. We all need to get more designers. Do we have any actual designers here? Are there any actual real people who do design full time? Come on, not one. Really? Still in bed. <laughs> Still in bed, huh? <laughs> you know, that's a problem, people. You know, need more designers. Uh, so continuing the tradition of really good, reasonably modern, quality web frameworks with horrible websites, I, I give you Django. And um, also Node.js. Um, you know, Node.js, I have to say, I've been doing this a long time. I earned this gray beard. And uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen a technology come out of the weeds and become mainstream as fast as Node.js. That's just astonishing. They need a designer, too, though. Anyhow. Um, so there's a lot of really good choices on the server side. Now, if you think about it a little bit, it's not that hard to figure out why software development on the server side is a friendlier and easier place to be. If you look inside a server side web app, the number of interfaces you have to talk to actually isn't that big. You've got your basic operating system stuff, files and processes and that kind of stuff. Plus, you have some sort of a persistence layer, database. And you have to talk to the actual HTTP requests and responses. That's the Apache feather to suggest that. So you know the number of interfaces isn't that big. And what that means is that the vast majority of your code is actually application code, dealing with application data, doing application logic. And there's also the wonderful effect that since mostly what you have is a request coming in, usually text, and an answer going out, mostly text, this stuff is intrinsically deeply testable, both at the unit test, the system test, the smoke test. And I think it's not controversial to say that software that's easy to test is usually better software. On the other hand, if you are building a client software, for example, native mobile client software, the device you're talking on has still, of course, the persistence layer, the, the HTTP layer, and the uh, uh, operating system layer. But it also has you know, a microphone, and speakers, and a telephone, and a compass, and a camera, actually a couple of two cameras these days, and a GPS, and three different kinds of radios there, and a vibrator, which provides, wait a second. You're laughing at the vibrator? There's the API. Static Boolean has vibrator. Um, but, but the effect of that is that when you're actually writing code in this kind of thing, the typical piece of code is well, you respond to an event. They tapped on the screen. So exciting. And you, know, you have to respond to that event, do a little teeny piece of application logic, and then make a bunch of calls back into the framework to do user interface stuff, which, which means you know, you're spending most of your time just little bits of your code running around this huge API surface. And that's OK. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with that kind of programming, except for it means that unit testing is brutally difficult, verging on impossible. And you know, I, I, I write code, both server and client side. And in the no recent years, I've never shipped se uh, server code that didn't have a serious high coverage test suite. And I'll be honest, I've never shipped Android code that had really much of a test suite at all. One takeaway from that is that you know, uh, use static languages. If you don't have testing, you need st statically typed languages. Um, another really wonderful thing about programming on the server side is that we have somewhat started to wriggle free of the grasp of the notion that object orientation is everything. You know, object oriented is what's good and everything else is second right. And, in, and chiefly, we've started to become under the influence of functional programming thinking. And you know, for most of us, functional programming was a completely incomprehensible three-week unit in our second year programming course or third year programming course. And these days, um, I think for most serious practitioners, functional programming has become something that produces better software. 
It gives a cleaner, clearer, simpler way to think about software, and it's also the only way we have to make our software run fast now that Moore's law means we have more cores, not faster cores. So you need to do parallelism. And since I'm in Europe, you, know, you absolutely can't talk about functional programming without talking about Erlang. Um, this is a, piece of, a, a little piece of sample code I wrote like eight years ago or something like that. And there's something about it that makes it popular. It now shows up in the speeches from the Erlang evangelists, which makes me happy. It's actually a little piece of code that on the left uh, implements a, 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 a counter, something that you can add one and then find out what the value is. And on the right is the code you use to access the counter. Now, I'm gonna not going to walk through it, um, but the thing that makes Erlang unique is that if you were writing sort of big data code where you were trying to keep track of a few million unique objects and count the occurrences of each, you could do that with this code and run those million instances in parallel, and you would never, ever, ever have a concurrency bug or a data race or any of those horrible things that can happen just because of the way Erlang is built. Um, on the other hand, you know, I love Erlang and the thinking it's given us, but I don't actually think Erlang is going to become a, p a mainstream IT business language because it's just a little too weird. I mean, to start with, it doesn't have variables. I understand why that's good, but you know, I like variables. Sometimes I just want to add some one to something. Um, and it also doesn't really have objects or types, really. And you know, we're kind of used to having those, those things. Um, but the lessons Erlang teaches are, are, are super important. Now, the, those lessons are being picked up. Oh, and I should also say we should not disrespect Erlang. Much and all as it's weird and idiosyncratic, it was also the engine that powered the WhatsApp application that just got b bought by Facebook for I can't even say that number without feeling sick to my stomach, so like a really, really big number. Um, but you know, the lessons that came out of Erlang are being propagated around the industry, and a lot of the attention goes to Clojure, which not only you know, is, is a well-implemented Lisp that runs on the JVM, but has some of the most mature uh, primitives for doing parallel concurrent programming that I've ever seen. Really, really well thought through. Good stuff. Once again, like Erlang, I don't actually think it's going to become a mainstream IT language. And the reason for that is because it's a Lisp. You know, and if Lisp were going to win, it would have done so 50 years ago. It's had 50 years, and you know, it's had its chance. Um, and then, of course, the other big thing we're looking at on the server side these days a lot is, is Scala, um, which tries to be both object-oriented and functional and runs on the JVM, and there's a lot of reasons to like it. I, I don't, actually. I, I think it's way too syntax-heavy, and, and I find it hard to read. But on the other hand, you know, a lot of people are building good stuff with it. For me, what's really got me excited on the server side is, uh, I'll give you an example of an application I wrote recently. You type in an email address, and it goes out and finds out what identity providers are probably going to work for you. And it does a lot of weird things. It goes and looks in the DNS records, it goes and looks in Webfinger and Webfist and a whole bunch of obscure Google and Facebook and Microsoft Cloud APIs, all in parallel. Does that, is this, do you serve this email address? And of course, this is a deeply parallel kind of thing. All these things have to go execute in parallel. And here's the go co core of the code that I wrote to do that, which is written in the Go programming language. And since I don't work for Google anymore, um, you know, I'm somewhat less prejudiced when I, think, when I say that I think that Go is really, really a big deal. Now, Go is not really explicitly functional, um, and it throws away 80% of conventional object orientation, and what it has left in terms of interfaces and classes still seems to be awfully useful. So I'm wondering if, if that 80% that it threw away was actually uh, very interesting. But anyhow, it's got this notion of a typed channel. Once again, I'm not going to walk through this, this, this code, but it's got this notion of you have a, a data type, and when you want to do a bunch of things in parallel, you just say, go this routine, go that routine, go the other routine, and you pass them all the channel, and then you sit there and listen to the channel results coming back. And it's something that is, feels fairly idiomatic for somebody who's grown up in C++ or Java or really any conventional language. But if you look at the effect it achieves, it is precisely the effect of a functional programming actor. And it, and it makes that so idiomatic that you'd be crazy not to use it. And, and you know, I think this maybe gets you 80% of what you need in functional programming uh, with a lot less abstraction and weirdness. Um, and it's, it's familiar. I think it really has a chance of becoming um, mainstream. So we have all these great choices, you know, a, 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 a number of well-developed, well-debugged, high-quality, high-performance choices to do stuff on the server side. And I have to say, all, not only just the coding side, the persistence side is excellent. Here's a slide that somebody oops, snuck out of the recent Cassandra Summit. 
um, you know, with somebody who's got 75,000 Cassandra no nodes with tens of petabytes, doing millions of operations per second. And I'm hearing these kind of stories all the time around Cassandra. And not just Cassandra. There's lots of other post-relational NoSQL databases. And near as I can tell, they all seem to be pretty good. Now, I don't actually know who this slide was, but, you know, those are the people who were representing at Cassandra Summit. So this is not you know, corner case, hippie, radical stuff. This, Cassandra has clearly leapt into the mainstream. So life is good on the server side. Let's be happy about that. OK, now let's be sad. Um, so Wired says the web is dead. And actually, it's clearly the case that Wired is wrong. Because even if native mobile apps are tending to squeeze the browser out, um, they are still doing all their networking with HTTP. They are still doing all their formatted text rendering with web views. And they are still accessing, addressing all their data with URIs. So web technology is clearly healthy and good and with us for the long term. The only question is whether the actual client you're using is a browser or a native mobile web app. Um, and that leads us to a discussion of the elephant in the room. Earlier, I asked how many of you were doing mostly client-side stuff, and the number wasn't that big. It's not that many. And it's even worse than that. Given that number, your management can e expect to get approximately one-third the amount of software that that number of people should be able to produce. And the reason is because in the mobile space, we have to do everything three times. We have to do a web app and an iOS app and an Android app. And we're just stuck with that. And I don't know about you, but I think we're sort of talent limited in this, uh, in this world. And it, it sort of sucks to have to do everything three times, but I don't see the way out of the box. Now, there is one way out of the box. And you can see it by looking at the top grossing apps in the Google Play Store for Android, which are mostly games. Oh, these are just the games, because that's where all the money is. And if you look closely at them, a very high proportion of them are not actually Java language, Android uh, app framework apps, a high proportion of them are C++ apps using the Unity or Unreal engines to do the, to, to do the actual programming. And um, the dirty secret is that 80% of the code, the Unreal C++ code, is exactly the same on Android and iOS and Windows, Windows phone machines. And so I guess the answer to the old question of write once, run anywhere is C++. That wasn't supposed to be the right answer. Um, but, you know, there's some other people in the room who are already saying, that, well, no, no, we have another answer for that. And so I offer you PhoneGap and Apache Cordova, which have the idea that you write your app in JavaScript, and then you auto-magically package it up, and wow, all of a sudden it's a native Android app, and it's a native iPhone app, and everything's wonderful, and instead of one-third the amount of work, you've done all the work that can be expected. Well. No, actually. I invite you to look at the phones in your own pockets and see how many of the apps you're actually using were produced this way. And for most of us, the answer is zero. Um, and actually, th these kinds of things definitely have a place in the world, in particular when you're doing a quick and dirty app for you know, an event you're putting on, or you're doing something internal for your company to organize something. You know, this, this can get the job done really quick with perfectly acceptable results. But if the app you're building is you know, your organization's brand that you're going to offer the world, I'm sorry, it just isn't here yet in terms of the fit and finish and polish and so on. So let's face reality. And the reality is that. Um, People want mobile apps. And in particular, management wants mobile apps. And let's be honest, you know, in this year, the number of mobile devices is exceeding the world population. And every one of those things is a magnet that's pulling native mobile apps behind it. And also, 2014 is the year when Google is going to start to see more queries from mobile devices than from desktop devices. So you know, the, the traction is, is obviously huge. Now, this is not a new thing. Um, Ever since the web first came along, people have been saying, oh, well, the web's OK, but it's not really responsive enough and immersive enough, and we need something better. Of course, the people who've been saying that have usually been people trying to sell something allegedly better, such as Flash and uh, Silverlight and uh, JavaFX. <laughs> JavaFX, what a joke. They're still working on that stuff? Gosh. Anyhow, um, but let's be realistic. Um, I've gotten this far into the, cartoon, into the thing without doing a, uh, a uh, XKCD cartoon. But frankly, the, uh, 
the reality is that the management community has got themselves convinced that they've got to be shipping native mobile apps or they're not going to be taken seriously. You know, the, the native mobile app, you've got to have it. I don't care what you are. You're, you're, a, pet, you're, a, you're a pet food store website. Well, you have to ask for, for an app. And, and frankly, there has been some pushback against that, and, and that's uh, reasonably desirable. In fact, here's my favorite pushback against it, um, you know, an extremely obscene Tumblr, which I, I see they stopped updating it last year, but it, it, it's, it, it's, it's still pretty funny. Um, if you, you know, want a deeper and more reasoned discussion of uh, why the, the, the stampede towards native mobile apps is maybe not such a big idea, uh, Jeff Outwood, the guy who did Stack Overflow, um, has a, a pretty good take on that at quite some length. And, you know, you could say that, well, okay, the pressure to go to native mobile apps is fine, but if you're just doing a publication, you don't really need a native mobile app. Well, that's just not true. I don't know. I, I use the Economist app all the time. My, my wife is a complete news hound, and she lives inside the BBC native mobile app. Um, you know, just because it's a publication doesn't mean it doesn't need to be a, a native mobile app. So the pressure is extreme. And here's the dirty secret, is the pressure is not just coming from management. A lot of developers would actually rather be building native mobile apps than single page application web apps. And one reason for that is because the native mobile app SDKs are really, really good. This is a sort of a system block level overview of the Android app framework SDK, SDK app framework. Um, and if, you, if I pulled up the Cocoa Touch iOS framework, it would also look similarly well thought out and rational. And both of these are being built by elite engineering teams. I was in the Android group at Google for two years, and I have never met a better engineering team. They are, they are people who have, they are not particularly young people. They are based on experience. They've de been there before. They know what works and what doesn't work. These are really very plausible and mostly very good uh, SDKs for building modern graphical user interfaces. And of course, there's a lot of smart people working on browser technology too. But you know, I'm not sure they're catching up. You've got these huge elite teams at both Google and Apple making the native mobile app development environment better, and they've got really great IDEs and debuggers and performance analyzers and profilers and screen layout designers, and any question you need to ask is instantly answered by Stack Overflow. Um, it, it, it's, it's really a very powerful and good programming environment. So it's going to be tough to catch up if you're behind. But wait, 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 I go to Google I.O. Well, I didn't go to Google I.O. For the first time in four years, I didn't go to Google I.O. And whenever you go to Google I.O., these bright, enthusiastic people from the Chrome group get up and say, HTML5 rocks! And it sort of does, actually, particularly the HTML part of HTML5 rocks. Um, and, and look at this great app we built. It uses the accelerometer. It uses the GPS. It has a native like mobile experience. Isn't it great? And, and yeah, it is, but I don't know. Things really aren't all that great, to be brutally honest, in the world of browser programming. I mean, to start with, suppose somebody asked you to build a modern single page application using browser technology that um, was just written in naked JavaScript and talked directly to the na naked DOM. Well, that would probably be a really bad idea. So, to start with, the b basic underlying API, object-level API of the browser, the DOM, is, is more or less unacceptable. And so we see things like, you know, obviously jQuery, which is, I would be argue, should now be regarded as the uh, browser platform assembler language, the, you know, the, the, the level at which no sane person, w w below which no sane person w would ever program. Um, and you know, jQuery is actually pretty good. And, and then, of course, we've learned on the server side that uh, model view controller is a nice way to build apps. So we now have that for the, uh, for the web platform as well. You know, big, uh, complex, uh, high-level abstraction-heavy toolkits. And maybe, you know, you like that idea, but you don't like Google too much, and you think Angular is too simple. So you can go and use uh, Ember.js instead um, and get your MVC in a different flavor. And then, of course, you can use things like Backbone uh, JS to pull together parts of your application. And maybe that's even, you know, still not really a high-level enough abstraction for you. So let's, let's go up, up one level even more and have web components. Componentize all the things. Move past those boring old HTML tags. Make your own tags for your own application. Life is wonderful. 
mostly. Um, so we have a lot of churn in the API space. And the thing is, there's something else that's the new hotness every month, practically, it seems. And so you know, this is the level we're addressing our, our basic API problem by building up layers of software on top of it. Unfortunately, the API problem is not the only problem we're facing in the browser programming space. The other problem is the fact that, well, when you come right down to it, uh, of, of all the great programming languages, JavaScript isn't one of them. You know. Um, so what are we going to do about that? You know, our actual basic programming language is probably not good enough. It, it's kind of ugly and kind of stupid, and it's full of dangerous things, and it's not fast enough. So one thing you could do would be to you know, replace it with another, another, a whole new programming language. And uh, Dart is probably particularly relevant in this context because it's substantially built right here in Aarhus, Denmark. Do we have any Dart people in the, in the crowd here today? I don't see, I, oh, I saw one, I think, there at the, at the back. Anyhow, so it, it's substantially built right here in, in Aarhus, Denmark, and it's actually got some nice things to it. You know, it's got this optional static typing, which, which, which I think is, is, is certainly worthy of exploration. And then also the other problem is that, uh, uh, you know, Dart not being fast enough, or sorry, JavaScript not being fast enough, well, maybe if we throw away 95% of JavaScript and leave ASM.js, then we'll get something that actually is fast enough, and we can build a new, another whole set of layers of software on top of that. Although I have to notice I'm not actually hearing that much ASM.js uh, buzz these days. There was a big hot idea a couple of years ago. And of course, then there's the ugliness of JavaScript. And one good way to deal with that is to uh, you know, build a, another higher level of uh, um, uh, software on top of it in the form of CoffeeScript, which actually, I have to say, some people who I respect immensely are building very high level, very interesting, very good looking software, software in CoffeeScript. So I think CoffeeScript deserves some respect. Two of my favorite programmers at the moment are two guys named uh, Max Crone and Chris Coyne, who built um, uh, OkCupid, okay the famous dating site, and some other stuff. And they have actually got a, a slight re revision of CoffeeScript called Ice CoffeeScript, which um, well, I'm not going to describe it here, go into detail, but I have to say the code they actually produce, if you look at some of the code they ship, is, is almost magically short and clean and comprehensible. So, so here's another thing that, that's worth, worth paying attention to. So we've got our, 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 a, our bad API problem, which we solved by piling many layers of APIs on top of it. Then we've got our bad language problem, which we solved by maybe replacing it with a different language and you know, maybe piling other languages on top of that. And then we also have the problem with our visual rendering in ecosystem. And the fact of the matter is, when you come right down to it, CSS actually kind of sucks. Um, now, having said that, we, we, we should um, have some historical respect. The people who were building CSS were doing it in 1990 freaking six, okay, when the number of people in the world who'd actually built a modern website with the kind of, you know, reactive characteristics and so on that we would like to see today was exactly zero. So everybody said cascading style sheets. That sounds good, so we can, you know, have a, a sort of a notion of inheritance, and that's great. And box model, sure, why not? Let's use a box model. What could, what could go wrong with that? Of course, you know, with the benefit of all those years of hindsight, we can see that everything would have been much better better if we'd had a grid model and some like variables and some modularity and, and some of those other things. But that's okay because just like everything else, we can solve this by piling more layers of software on top of it. You know, things like less CSS, which gives you, you know, a certain amount of modularities and variables and mix-ins and some sort of object-oriented flavored goodies. And of course, SAS, which is sort of less as competitor. Uh, I, you know, as an occasional Rubyist, I'm, I'm a big fan of SAS. It, uh, it, it seems to hit a sweet spot in terms of the amount of work you have to do and, and what, 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 what you get for it. Um, you know, but in the rearview mirror, it's obvious that CSS's biggest number one problem is that we really want to think about our pages in terms of grids, and, and CSS makes that hard. So obviously, there are things like Twitter Bootstrap, which I've used, and I bet a lot of people in this room have used. Bootstrap became amazingly popular because uh, it gives you a grid model of the page. On the other hand, Bootstrap also brought along a lot of other baggage in terms of the way it wants buttons to look and forms to look and this kind of stuff. And it's getting so, anybody who's done much of this can look at a lot of pages out there on sites out there on the web and say, oh yeah, that's another Bootstrap, that's another Bootstrap, that's another Bootstrap. And it turns out that you know, the real value in Bootstrap was mostly just the grid 
thing. And so you can actually go out and get the grids without getting all the other bootstrap stuff. So here's a thing called Bourbon Neat built on top of SAS that actually looks pretty slick to me. Um, but the one that's actually gotten my attention is yet another thing built on top of uh, SAS called uh, Zen Grids. And I'm actually going to rip up maybe this year, soon anyhow, the, my 15-year-old handcrafted CSS for my blog and probably replace it with Zen Grids. And I expect the amount of code to reduce by a factor of about five, um, and that'll all be good. So did I ever just go through a lot of technology? Let me just enumerate it to keep it fresh in your mind. What did I went through? I went through jQuery, Angular, Ember, Backbone, Polymer, Dart, ASMJS, CoffeeScript, Iced CoffeeScript, Less, SAS, Bootstrap, Bourbon Neat, and Zen Grids. Isn't all that creativity wonderful? Do you think I got them all? <laughs> I bet you whatever the new hotness is this month, I didn't get it because, you know, I've been traveling a lot. And if you wanted to uh, express, it, express it mathematically, you, know, you, you, get, you, you get something like this, you know. It's hard to think of an X for, for which there's not an, an X.js. But, you know, math, math is kind of a hard-edged discipline, and I think we try and be a little bit more humanistic and, and, and life-oriented in, in this world. So let's take a, a biological view of it. And, and this, is, this reminds me of what's going on in the browser. It's a picture of what they call the Cambrian explosion, a period when evolution went crazy and produced all sorts of really strange, weird, and mostly non-viable life forms, most of which only exist in the form of 500-year-old fossils, 500-million-year-old fossils. Um, but on the other hand, this explosion of creativity also led to some good evolutionary paths that produced, among other things, us. Um, so, you know, I guess there's nothing intrinsically wrong with being in the period of an explosion of, of evolutionary creativity. Unless, of course, you happen to bet on the browser equivalent of, you know, one of those creatures that died away and isn't here anymore. Um, and we don't have 500 million years. A million minutes is two years. And, you know, the browser is under attack at a very high pace. Um, what are we going to do? We need to, like, accelerate some of this evolution. I have a war story here that popped up on Reddit that I'm going to read to you, because I don't think you can read the screen. I recently worked on a six-month-long project building an internal data analytics tool that would let non-technical folks slice and dice one of our primary data stores. I think we assumed going in the server-side piece would be where we spent most of the time, but it was actually trivial given the incredible tool set on the server. We ran into problems when it came to building a web app to display this data. All of the developers needed to learn JavaScript and jQuery, which aren't altogether difficult, but have strange quirks. And then CSS SAS, which can be conceptually difficult for newcomers. No, no, you just can't do height 100%. Why? Well, yes, it is strange that your div is behind your other div, even though it has a higher Z index. You need to clear fix that outer div to fix all the way those things are floating over each other. What's a clear fix? Oh, it's a well-accepted hack. And then Backbone, and Marionette to make Backbone better, and require JS because JavaScript doesn't have a linker. And of course, you need to package and minimize this stuff up together because you wind up having to load a megabyte of JavaScript before you can click a button. Thank God this is an internal tool because the idea of making it work in IE is terror-inducing. The number of WTFs per person per day was probably five to 10 times higher on the front-end piece. Um, and realistically, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we're sitting. So going back to the Cambrian explosion, I want to introduce one of my favorite creatures, Opabinia regalis, um, five eyes, a long-nosed horizontal pincer. They died out. Thank goodness. I wouldn't want to go swimming, you know, with, with those in the water. And, you know, when I look at that, there is actually one well-known piece of star.js that I think of, but I'm not going to name names. Um, how do you avoid be betting on the piece of JavaScript that turns out to be this? I'm serious. I would be terrified if I were tasked with building a major single-page application right now of knowing which tool to build. So I'm going to repeat. If we want to hoist the quality of the browser developer ecosystem so that it's competitive with native mobile, we need some damn, damn accelerated evolution. We need to figure out which of the branches are these ones and kill them off. I mean, the picture is more or less like this. There are parts of the browser ecosystem that are just great. HTML is fine. HTTP is fine. URIs are a good way to address data. But then we've got those problems with you know, our, our, our style sheeting model, our programming model, and our programming language. And then we've got all this other stuff that springs up to work around that. So what are we going to do about that? We need to cook this down to a small number of things. Um, but maybe we could actually just fix those red boxes. 
you know, revise the browser. Ship a new version of the browser that has a nice grid-based style sheet model and a nice query-based uh, API, object API, and a nice modern programming language with some of the things we've learned about programming languages. When you leave Google and you're not actually getting fired or stomping out rage quitting, it's traditional to post a, an exit rant when you talk about, you know, what you think Google should be doing. So that was more or less my exit rant. Google should just fix that. Google's the only organization I can think of that can. But on the other hand, maybe this is inevitable. Maybe it's natural. Maybe the browser is the primary user interface to the world is over. We are organically evolving to the direction where everything is a native mobile app. And I hope not, because that future is not one that makes me particularly happy. I'm going to close with a picture of a forest that's near where I live. And I love forests. I spend as much time as them, in them as I can. And one of the things that, that makes them beautiful is the remarkable freedom each of those trees has to grow and become as wonderful as it can without asking any other tree's permission. Of course, it has to compete with them, but that's just fine. And the beauty of each tree is great, but the beauty of the forest that they produce together is immensely greater. And it reminds me a lot of the web and the single most important fact about the web, which we are in danger of forgetting, which is the web is the only major computing platform that has ever existed that does not have a vendor. You don't have to ask anybody's permission. So concretely, if we move to a world where the native mobile app is the interface to everything, we have a small problem and a big problem. The small pro problem is code latency update. If something's on the internet and it's broken, you can fix it with a latency of, what, minutes maybe? Even at Google, where they had apps that are being used by a billion people, you could roll out an update in an afternoon, no big deal. On the other hand, if you need to update your code and it's native mobile app, well, in the Android ecosystem, you're talking about hours of latency. I don't know if you've noticed, but Google Play Update is getting slower and slower and slower. And the worst thing is that all those end users out there may decide, no, I'm not going to take that update. You know, I'm just going to keep using the old version. And of course, in the, in the Apple ecosystem, your latency is measured in days at best, maybe weeks. And maybe Apple will just say, no, nah, we don't like you anymore. And of course, they might not take the update. So do you have a really nasty core dumping, security spilling, privacy leak, we're leaking, password exposing bug? Well, it sucks to be you. But if you're actually a citizen of the internet on the web, you can fix it. That's a small problem. The big problem is that over the last decades, we've learned the right way to use the internet. The right way to use the internet when you want to do something is to position your cursor in that little search window at the top of your browser and say, here's what I want to do. And it'll go and find what you want to do, and you'll click on it, and you use it, and you do it. And everything you go to is a first-class citizen of the internet. On the other hand, you can go search an app store with their crappy search tools and their crowds and crowds of useless junk and their week, you know, their days of delay to update, and their curating vendor, you're back in somebody's plantation using their farm, and then download it and try to understand the permissions it asks for and figure out if you're being safe. And all of a sudden, the internet is no longer a platform without a vendor. So I want an internet where people like the people in this room can write beautiful software and post beautiful software and have people use beautiful software without having to ask anybody's permission, without having to go through the curation process. I don't think we can stick our heads in the sand and say native mobile apps are going to go away, but I don't think we should just go with the flow and go with the direction people are trying to take us right at the moment. So I don't have a firm progress plan of action for how to get there from here, but I'm pretty sure that, as with the first issue I raised in my speech, you know, you can either ignore the problem or you can try and be part of the solution. So I encourage you all to be part of the solution, and, and let's hope we still have our browser uh, when I come back here after, in another five years. Thank you.